One of the key things that we still don't know about the universe is how heavy something needs to get before it can collapse under gravity to form a black hole. Physicists like Oppenheimer have attempted to theoretically calculate what that mass is over the years, when that crush of gravity becomes too much. And we've also tried to find as many black holes as we can in the universe to try and figure out what is the lightest black hole that's out there. Also, we can understand when this switch occurs from something known as a neutron star, so going from the heaviest neutron star and then collapsing down into the lightest black hole. The problem is, there's a gap. Mind the gap. The heaviest neutron star known is 2.08 times the mass of the sun, and the lightest black hole known is five times the mass of the sun. So we can't test whether our theories and our maths is right that predicts that that switch between neutron star and black hole happens right in the middle of that gap at 2.2 times the mass of the sun. To do that, we have to keep looking for objects that fall in this gap so that we can help solve this mystery of when black holes actually form. Now, thankfully, a new research paper has come out this month that has done just that. This work from Barring collaborators found an object in orbit around a pulsar, so a type of neutron star, that they reckon is between 2.1 and 2.7 times the mass of the sun that they don't detect any light from. So in this video, we're gonna chat first about how you actually calculate that limit of the maximum mass of a neutron star when that switch to a black hole happens. Second, how Barr and collaborators found this object in this mass gap by studying it in orbit around the pulsar J0514-4002E. Three, how they actually worked out the object's mass. And then four, whether what they found is a neutron star or a black hole. But before we dive into that, you might be wondering if you see an article that covers research like this, how do you know that it's legitimate scientific research or not? Well, thankfully the sponsor of today's video, Ground News has us covered. They gather related articles from around the world in one place so you can really get a deep understanding of any topic. What I absolutely love about Ground News is that you can read the original report alongside the media's interpretation of it. And I can even filter the sources based on how reliable their reporting practices are to ensure I'm getting the best information possible. Which is not just useful for science news with everything going on in the world right now. It's even more vital when you're dealing with stories where facts and opinion can easily get conflated. That's why Ground News has a dedicated news feed. It's called The Blind Spot and it highlights stories that are disproportionately covered by only one side of the political spectrum. So here you can discover stories that you might be missing, but perhaps more importantly, keep an eye out for those misleading media narratives. They also highlight media bias on a specific sort of overall topics page because even reporting on something as like apolitical as space and science can be affected by biased algorithms. Look, I really believe in what they're doing at Ground News. So head to ground.news slash Dr. Becky to check them out. And if you use my link, you'll get 30% off their unlimited access Vantage plan. The same one I use to stay on top of important discoveries and world events. So don't miss out. All right, now let's get back to the science. And first, let's chat about how you calculate when the switch between neutron star and black hole happens. So to understand how black holes form, we first have to understand what happens when a star dies. So if you've got a star that's say 10 times more massive than the sun, when it runs out of hydrogen fuel in its core to fuse together to make helium, which is the process that, you know, produces light and heat in stars, then it will die. It will throw off its outer layers in a supernova and leave behind a glowing helium core. And with no process producing energy in that core anymore, there's nothing pushing outwards against gravity crushing inwards. And so the core of the star gets crushed down into what's known as a neutron star. The immense gravity crushing inwards on all of the matter that makes it up takes the electrons and protons that make up the atoms and actually forces them together to merge and become neutrons, the neutral particles that make up atoms. This is how you end up with a neutron star. You have neutrons as tightly packed as they can go, and now that's what's resisting the crush of gravity down. But there's only so much force crushing inwards that those neutrons can actually resist. At some point, if you make your neutron star even heavier and heavier, 
you're going to reach a point where the whole thing is going to collapse under gravity and you are going to form a black hole where nothing, not even light, can escape. You can also do this if you start with a much heavier star in the first place, so something that's like 25 times the mass of the sun rather than like 10 times the mass of the sun. In that case, the core will be so big from the beginning of the supernova, when it runs out of fuel, it will just immediately collapse down into a black hole. And it's worth saying here that this will never happen to the sun. The sun isn't massive enough to do this. Its core will actually become what's known as a white dwarf. So the neutron stars are the sort of baby siblings to black holes, white dwarfs are the baby siblings to neutron stars. So if you want to work out, you know, at what mass do you get this switch from neutron star to black hole, you have to work out, okay, how much force can neutrons actually resist in terms of gravity crushing downwards? And the first people to realize this and to try to theoretically calculate it were George Volkoff and Robert Oppenheimer using the work of Rick Richard Tolman, a moment that was actually depicted in the recent film Oppenheimer, and also led them to be the first people to mathematically predict the existence of black holes. This was back in 1939, and they actually left out a few key bits of physics from their calculations, which meant that they got an answer for the limit of a neutron star's mass that was a bit too low, at 0.7 times the mass of the sun. But this limit is still known as the tolman oppenheimer volkov limit in their honour, or the TOV limit. Actually, it might just be me that calls it the TOV limit. Maybe most people call it the TOV limit, but I feel like it, it is a word in itself, so I, I just say TOV. Over the years, that limit to the neutron star's mass has been refined further. A lot of work was done during the 90s that brought it to between 2.2 and 2.9 times the mass of the sun. But then in 2017, we detected the merger of two neutron stars using the gravitational waves they give off, like ripples through space itself, which allowed us to better refine our models of neutron stars and also test Einstein's theory of general relativity, our best theory of gravity. And then that put the limit in the range of 2.01 to 2.16 times the mass of the sun. If only it was that simple though, because like all things in physics, there's always something to just complicate it slightly. And for neutron stars, it's the fact that if they're spinning, they can actually have a higher mass before they collapse down into a black hole. And neutron stars are known to spin, in most cases, very rapidly because they actually inherit like the rotational energy of the star before them. But because obviously you've compressed all of the matter down, but kept the spin, it's kind of like an ice skater pulling in their arms to spin even faster, right? The more compact they are, the faster they spin. Like the fastest spinning neutron star that we know of spins at 716 times per second, which means that its equator is moving at like a quarter of the speed of light, which is just incredible to think of. It means if they are spinning that fast, then your physics changes slightly. And it means that the neutrons can actually resist a greater crush of gravity down, meaning the neutron star can get heavier before it collapses down into a black hole. So if you run the maths, you work out that a spinning neutron star can be up to 20% heavier than the maximum limit for a non-spinning neutron star, which brings the TOV limit up to close to 2.6 times the mass of the sun, just to complicate things. So this is why we really need to find objects in this mass range of around about two to three times the mass of the sun to work out like, is it a neutron star that's just rapidly spinning or is it something that's already collapsed into a black hole or not? So we can test our theories and our maths of when do you have the heaviest neutron star and the lightest black hole. Which brings us to this research paper by Barr and collaborators who have claimed to do just that. So specifically, let's chat about how they actually found this object in this mass gap. Because by their nature, very compact objects don't give off a lot of light. And so they are very difficult to spot. Most of the time we actually find them in orbit around other objects like stars because they pull on the things that they're orbiting around, right? They make the star wobble around. And one of the best places to spot that sort of wobbling around effect is around something known as a pulsar. Pulsars are a type of neutron star which emit radio light in jets from their poles. And so they act like lighthouses across the universe as those beams sweep out and we detect them as like flashes or pulses of light. The timing that those pulses arrive from pulsars is incredibly precise, right? It's like a clock almost. And each pulsar is unique in the time between those pulses as well. And so if you detect a change in the arrival time of those pulses, then you know that something has affected 
the pulsar, perhaps making it wobble around. So Barr and collaborators actually spotted some anomalies in the arrival time of the pulses from pulsar j 514 4002 E. And that's what's plotted here. So on the y-axis is the difference in the arrival time from what you should expect it to be. And you can see the differences are really small, right? Because that's just how precise pulsars are. But it's enough for Barr and collaborators to say there is clearly something in orbit around this pulsar. And oh, by the way, we don't detect any light from it. But then how did they actually calculate this object's mass that's orbiting the pulsar? Well, from this timing of the pulses data, Barr and collaborators could actually measure many different properties of this binary system of the pulsar and this object in orbit around it. And then you can take those measured properties and plug them into our equations from general relativity, our best theory of gravity that will describe this orbit of the two objects. And then you can get at the total mass of the system, i.e. of both the pulsar and this companion in orbit around it. And you find that it's 3.887 times the mass of the sun. Now from there, if you model the orbits, again using general relativity, you can get at the separate masses of the two objects, the mass of the pulsar and the mass of the thing that's orbiting around it, its companion. The problem is that those models really heavily depend on what angle the orbit is with respect to us. So if the orbit is perfectly edge on to us, then the pulsar is 2.04 times the mass of the sun and its companion is 1.84 times the mass of the sun. So in that case, they're both neutron stars. But if the orbit is slightly angled to us, then the mass of the pulsar goes down and the mass of the black hole goes up. Of course, your pulsar still has to be a neutron star and the lowest mass pulsar I ever found was 1.17 times the mass of the sun. So if you set that as a limit to how low the pulsar mass can be, then you find the whole system can't be inclined less than 42.9 degrees to us, which means the companion can't be more than 2.7 times the mass of the sun. So that means the companion is somewhere in the range of 1.84 to 2.7 times the mass of the sun, right in this mass gap. But Barr and collaborators also had all that observational data, which they could then actually do sort of like a best fit model to, to try and find what are the best fit masses of the pulsar and its companion. And found that the best fit says the system's actually inclined at 52 degrees to us, giving the mass of the pulsar at 1.53 times the mass of the sun and the companion at 2.35 times the mass of the sun. Smack bang in the middle of that mass gap between neutron stars and black holes. It's both larger than the most precise pulsar mass ever measured for J0740 plus 6620 at 2.01 times the mass of the sun and lower than the most precise black hole mass that's been directly measured at five times the mass of the sun. So can we tell if this is a neutron star or a black hole? Well, sadly, no. Bar and collaborators say from the data they have, they can't tell. They tried searching for any radio pulses from the companion to work out if it too was a pulsar but couldn't see anything. Nor could they use any of the pulsar binary models to try and model the system to work that out either. However, they do point out that the top end of the range of masses for this object that they found overlaps with the range of masses of the remnants of neutron star mergers detected by LIGO, the gravitational wave detector. And the remnants of these mergers are thought to be black holes at this mass of around three-ish times the mass of the sun. So Barr and collaborators suggested that this companion of this pulsar is probably formed in the same way, right? From a past merger of two other neutron stars that's either formed a very heavy neutron star or a light black hole at the end of it and then has since found itself in orbit around this pulsar. Now that's not as unlikely as it might first sound because this pulsar and its companion are found in a very dense globular cluster of stars, right? Where the stars are packed in very close together, very dense, so you're likely to have interactions like this. But if this was the case, that this companion has been formed from the merger of two neutron stars, then there is technically a way that you should be able to tell in the data. Because if two neutron stars have merged and formed a black hole, then the black hole will have a much higher speed spin rate, so spinning around its axis, than if the two neutron stars merge and then form a neutron star at the end. 
And if that's the case, if it's a black hole with a much higher spin rate, then the spin will interact with the pulsar as the two orbit each other, causing the orbit itself to then wobble around, change the distance between them. And Barron collaborators work out the amount of change that that would cause on the system is less than a factor of 1.7 times 10 to the power of minus 13. Aye, that's a factor of 0.000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000